Hi YouTube, this is Joe Calton with Calton Cutlery. You can visit me on the web, CaltonCutlery.com. Okay, so this is going to be number 25 of the Making a New Knife Pattern series. And uh, I, I really hope this is going to be the last one. Um, there might be another one here in a couple of weeks when I'm done um, with the, uh, you know, the majority of the testing, you know, carrying the knife around for a couple of weeks and everything. Um, so, let's see, last video was uh, making the Kydex sheath. So I finished making the sheath uh, yesterday about uh, midday-ish, I think, something like that. Yeah, yeah, midday-ish, some, somewhere or other. So I carried the knife around all, all the rest of the day yesterday from, say, noon until, you know, 11 o'clock when I went to bed. And the first thing that I noticed was, remember how I told you about the uh, the Kydex rivets being too uh, uh, too far apart? Actually, hang on just a second. Okay, we'll use this one for an example. So, this is... Uh, this is actually uh, my second, um, I mean it's not the second um, pattern welded uh, blade that I've ever made, but it's the second one that I carried quite a bit. And it actually came up in my Facebook feed this morning as today is this knife's third birthday. Um, and it actually looks surprisingly good. I mean most knives, uh, well quite a few knives that I carry don't make it to their third birthday. Um, you know, I break quite a few of them just doing testing and just bash them and over sharpen them. I mean, just beat the ever living crap out of them, right? Because, well, I'd much rather I did that with my knives, you know, and that, you know, I can let you know what they can do versus, you know, you having to do the same thing. But anyways, so, um, remember me talking about the distance between the rivets and, you know, the belt loop, okay, and how important it is that your sheath fits your belt, okay? Um, every bit as important on a knife as it is on, say, like a holster, right? And the two biggest, or, or the, the biggest example I can give you for that is, um, is, is actually with a handgun, okay? Now, uh, I'm not going to break one of mine out, you know, and show you on holsters and everything, but think about uh, somebody who's a professional type who carries a handgun on a day-to-day -day basis, okay? Maybe it's police officer or uh, game and fish or two of the, uh, the classes of, of people that I come to mind right off the bat, right? Now, police officers typically have belts that are insanely overloaded with gear, right? I mean, they're typically carrying a pistol, um, you know, a full-size service pistol, you know, with at least two spare magazines, uh, a flashlight, a nightstick, a taser, uh, uh, um, uh, pepper spray, a radio, maybe, you know, well, maybe they don't even carry radios lately. I don't really pay that much attention. But, I mean, they've got a belt full of stuff, right? I mean, honestly, you kind of wonder how those guys don't have hip problems after just a couple of years of carrying all that stuff on their belts. But if you notice, when those guys move, the stuff that's on that belt, it might kind of jiggle a little bit, but it don't, I mean, it stays with them, okay? If you've ever seen a video of a cop running, I mean, all that stuff stays on his hip. It's not flopping around going everywhere. I mean, it stays with him, right? Game and Fish is probably another really good example um, because they're typically not carrying quite so much stuff on their belt. Typically, when I see a Game and Fish guy, you know, during the summertime and they're just wearing their, their red shirts and the, you know, jeans and everything and you can see their belt, their belt's typically got uh, a full-size service pistol on them and, you know, some extra magazines, possibly a, a small flashlight, something like that, right? But when those guys move, that, um, that pistol, even though it's a full-size service pistol, you know, a lot of those weigh, you know, two, three pounds, it doesn't move, I mean, it doesn't move opposite of the way, I mean, if they turn this way, that gun goes with them right away. You know, there's no lag time. Now, if you take that and you compare it to, say, a lot of times you see somebody walking around Walmart, right? And they've got, you know, a, um, whatever type of pistol it is, and they're carrying it in like a, an Uncle Mike's holster 
or even maybe a Kydex holster, but the holster and the belt aren't matched, you know, so they've got, you know, a very flimsy leather belt on, and they're trying to hang a, a three-pound pistol off the side of it. You see that pistol, it's flopping off to the side. I mean, they go this way, and then it kind of stays for a little bit, and then it comes with them. The, it hangs out at a different uh, angle. I mean, it just looks like it's really a pain in the butt, you know. So knives can be the same thing, all right? Only typically speaking, knives don't weigh as much as a, as a full-size service pistol does. So it's not quite as bad, but boy, if you ever have a properly fitted sheath to the belt and you've worked with something like that for a little while, anything less than a perfect fit up will just drive you bonkers. And it drove me bonkers with this knife and sheath for the eight hours or so that I carried it. I ended up having to go back and put extra rivets in it. Okay, so this part right here, um, you're probably going to see my belly, and I apologize for that, but okay, let's see. So we need to see the top half like that Dawn bottle from here, I think. This is where I probably should have waited until my boy got home, but okay, so this is the knife that we've been working on. Okay, now see how that when I move the butt of that knife, you see that belt flexes, okay? So it is a very, very tight fit. It's actually a little bit too tight. I need to redo it and loosen it up some. But, I mean, you can see that the belt has got, you know, I can get a couple of fingers up underneath there, but this fit right here is very, very tight. Now, the, remember the sheath, the, the knife to the sheath fit was also a little on the tight side, right? And I sure hope you're getting this because I can't see behind you. All right. But notice when I go to lift that, even though it's a really tight fit, that sheath flexes or the belt flexes up, but then the knife comes out. Okay. What was happening before, before I added these rivets right here, okay, is I would pull up on the handle, the whole sheath would come up until it hit the bottom edge of that belt loop that we made with the, um, uh, the paracord. And then, you know, it would stop it and then the knife would come out. Well, then when I went to resheath the knife, okay, so, and this blade is, I haven't decided if it might be just a hair too long. Um, but anyway, you put your index finger up on the point and then you bring your index finger up until you feel the opening of the sheath. You have to bring it up just a hair more put the tip into the sheath and then resheath it, right? Okay, well with this sheath moving all over my belt, I mean it was twisting this way, it was twisting that way, um, and then still the up and down. So when I went to resheath it, instead of it kind of being always in the same spot, sometimes it was down here, sometimes it was up here, okay? And that just gets to be a it just not cool, right? Okay, so what I did was I just added these extra um, rivets here so that, uh, you know, this space fit my belt, all right? So that's something that uh, um, will be changed on the, you know, the next run of these that I do because I do like the pattern well enough that, uh, that I'm definitely going to make some more of them. Okay, so enough looking at my belly there. All right, so that is going over the, the sheath to belt fit, okay? Um, one thing that I forgot to mention uh, in the two Kydex videos, because there's a part one and a part two, because they're, they were pretty long, but there's an awful lot that goes into Kydex, an awful lot that goes into sheath making that, um, that a lot of times you just don't realize if you're not a, a sheath maker yourself. It's one of those things that it's, uh, well, like what I was just talking to you about, you know, belt, belt to sheath fit, okay? If I do my job right and you receive the knife, you put it on, a lot of that stuff you'll never notice. All you'll notice is that, man, this sheath just, it just works really good. 
And you might not understand why. Well, that is an awful lot of the little bitty bits and pieces that makes that happen, okay? So that's why those sheaths videos were so long. But I did neglect to mention that Kydex, when I first started working Kydex, oh, 15 years ago or so now, um, all, I only ever saw it in black. I mean, that's, that's all you got it in. And I only remember having two different choices on the sizes, 16th of an inch and like 3 30 seconds or um, a little bit thicker than that. And that was it. Now, if you go to look on Jance's website, man, they must have 15, 20 different colors of Kydex on there. And I did a couple of knives for, um, a, there were a couple of custom orders where we put gray Kydex sheaths on them. And boy, those looked slick. Um, one of them was for a hiker, a good friend of mine. Um, I've never actually met him in person. I think, God, I think the guy's probably got 20 of my knives or so now. Um, and he's a hiker. Um, and so he wanted a belt knife that was nice and light um, <clears throat> and that looked friendly um, because he said he noticed that when he was carrying, um, uh, you know, a, like a normal belt knife, especially one with like a black Kydex sheath on it, he said people on the trail would look at him really funny. So we made him up a knife and then I think we put it into a uh, kind of a medium gray sheath. And uh, he said, man, that was a whole, diff whole different world. He said people would see that knife and they wouldn't even look twice at it. So that's pretty cool. So I thought I'd mention that right quick. Okay, <clears throat> so my thoughts on the knife. So I've been carrying it, like I said, now for uh, about 24 hours or so. And I'm really liking it. Um, I think it might be a little on the long side. Um, this other one, now it could be that I've been carrying this pattern now for... Uh, well, like I said, this one is, today's, this one's third birthday, and I want to say that I was, uh, so let's just say like seven or eight years I've been carrying this pattern, right? So I'm pretty used to where the point is in relation to everything else. And this one, um, you know, feels right. This one feels right, but a little bit on the big side. And so I'm not sure if this one actually is a little bit too big, or if it's just I'm so used to this one that this one feels too big. So... Um, but it is, it's a half inch longer in the blade and three eighths of an inch longer in the butt than what my old one is. So we'll, we'll have to see how I get used to that. But anyway, so I'm really liking it. I mean, we got a nice pointy point. We've got, you know, a three thirty seconds inch stock, which is, you know, um, entirely suitable for a belt type knife. We got a real high thin grind. Um, I think the next one of these that I carry, I might thicken that grind up just a little bit. Um, just because, like I said, I am pretty hard on knives. Um, you know, the overall balance and everything feels pretty good. Um, you know, the, uh, the thickness of the handle is a little bit thicker than what you would put on a neck knife because on a belt knife, we don't really have the weight restriction that we do on a, on a neck knife. And so I'm really liking it. So the last thing that we need to do besides just carry it and use the thing is decide what edge we're going to put on it for you know day-to-day -day use all right so you guys know that my in the past my favorite edge has been the dmt or smith's diamond 325 which they label as a course okay most of the work that i do is very rough work and I need an edge that I can put on extremely fast, that it's really fast to repair, and that it's very aggressive, okay? Like cutting rope, cutting leather, um, dressing out a deer or an elk, something like that. And uh, really in the past, I haven't liked polish, polished edges too much, okay? Like even a fine DMT, which the course is 325, I wanna say the fine is like a 600. Even that, to me, is has been too fine, okay? But lately, I've been thinking, you know, everybody keeps talking about these real fine, real high polished edges, all that kind of stuff, right? And how come they're so much better than a coarse edge, which that's not been my experience in the past, but, you know, my work habits are different now than what they have been in the past also. You know, I mean, I used to do a lot of handyman. Now I don't do quite so much handyman and now I'm mostly, you know, behind a computer and, you know, out in the shop making knives. 
So I thought, you know, let's go ahead and, and you know, start playing with some different edges again. So the other day I had this stone right here out. This is the, the King uh, 1000, 6000 grit water stone. Okay. And if you remember right, I did a freeze test on this stone. Okay. Stuck it in a bag of water and stuck it in the freezer and froze it overnight just to see what would happen. Right. And the consensus on that was that as far as I could tell, nothing happened. Okay. But I had the stone out and I was, uh, you know, I sharpened up my, you know, my last belt knife with it just to see if the stone itself felt any different or if it didn't cut the steel the same way. And so I thought, well, heck, I'll just leave that edge on there and see how I like it. And, you know, I mean, it's a m much more polished edge because I put a 6,000 grit edge on it. And I didn't really like it all that much at first, but then, you know, I started playing with it and I'm still not too sure that it's a favorite edge, but it is you know, a serviceable edge. I got to change the way I cut, not quite so much um, draws in my cut and everything, but I thought, okay, well that's uh, out of powder pattern welded steel. This one's out of straight 1095. So let's go ahead and put that, uh, uh, that 6,000 grit edge on it. <clears throat> um, I want to say on this one, it has got a, um, a crystalline uh, fine edge on it. I want to say that's what I put the rough edge. I mean, it's still, I mean, it still uh, takes some hairs and everything off. I mean, it's it's by no means dull, but we're going to put the um, the final edge on it for testing. So since um, since I don't have a sink in the new shop yet, I really need to get on that because it's really driving me nuts not having a sink out there. Uh, we need to get you where you can see. How about we just go like that? So anyway, so not having, um, you know, a sink in the shop and the shop being, you know, actually a ways away from the kitchen now, you know, my old shop was just my, my attached two car garage, you know, so I just left the kitchen, walked across the living room and, and bam, there was the door to the, the, the old shop. So I actually went ahead and set up this, uh, um, you know the the sink bridge type deal it's two two by sixes a short one and a long one screwed together um, I guess you know this is a pretty standard way to do this um, I've also got you know my oil stones and my diamond stones or an oil st or two oil stones and a diamond stone here in the kitchen in addition to this water stone so it's not just a straight up water stone setup um, it's just a sharpening stone setup and it seems to be working pretty good I'm not too sure um, that I like the width of it. Um, I made it out of two by sixes because that's the scrap that I had on hand. I might go back and make it out of two by fours instead, um, you know, after I play with this a little bit. Because if you set it up, it works good for right handed sharpening, but then you go to left handed sharpening and you have to move the stone over. So, anyway, so what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and um, Go ahead and put up that 6,000 grit edge on this, okay? So I'm gonna start off with a 1,000 grit side and bring a burr up on one side. And it shouldn't take long because, I mean, it's not like we've got damage to repair or anything. Okay, there it is. Well, now the dishes are in the way. And I'm going at a little bit steeper angle than what I would normally also because um, because like I said this is a pretty high thin grind for for what I'm after with this knife okay now we got the burr almost to the other side you guys are probably screaming right now Joe what on earth are you doing you don't like fine edges Okay, now we'll just refine it a little bit on this 1000 grit side. Yeah, 
yeah so i've been carrying that that knife over there with that 6000 grit edge on it now for um what's that been at least a couple of weeks um since i i shot that video maybe as many as three and i've noticed that um i've just got a, a paper towel up underneath here and i've noticed that <clears throat> that edge tends to slip a little bit before it bites in okay so um uh, so let, let's say i'm cutting a piece of rope right okay well, well with that uh, uh that coarser edge that uh 325 grit edge i touch that rope you know i touch that rope and immediately as soon as that blade comes this way or that way at all that edge is just ripping right through that that rope right i mean it's a very aggressive edge okay with this highly polished edge the 6000 grit edge i notice that i have to push harder to get it to cut but then it doesn't matter if the the blade is 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 drawing or pushing or um you know if it's moving this way or not it'll just cut straight through it like that and so it's it's a quite a bit different feel than what i'm used to Okay, so we move that burr back and forth. Now let's go to the 6,000 grit side. And just kind of shine up those, those 1,000 grit scratches. Now this part right here is where um, that 6,000 grit stone is where my fingers start... Um, start having a problem feeling the, the burr on it. Mm, better go a little bit more. I think I can feel the burr there, but I'm not really, you know, it's not like a definite type of deal. Okay, there we go. We're pretty much done. All right, so now um, let's go ahead and refine that burr a little bit. Okay, now, since we've been doing so much uh, Murray Carter style here, instead of doing a micro bevel on this one, let's go ahead and do uh, his method of uh, taking the burr off. So let's first let's lighten it by doing some stone stropping. Okay, so all right, now I can't really feel the burr on either side, okay? Which means that it's either mostly gone or it's lined up with the edge, okay? Either way is good. So now let's lightly draw it through the wood. I'm still not feeling any there. So let's stone strop it a couple of times. Um, what you're doing there is, if there was a burr there and you ripped it off by drawing it through that wood, um, you'll leave kind of like little ragged spots in the edge where that steel was torn out from uh, the contact with the or you know the, the wood pulling the burr out so by stone stropping it you're just uh, smoothing out those rough spots you know we feel like we got a pretty good edge let's see if uh, you can tell I was finishing up knives the other day oh yeah yeah it's popping here on that side and then you always go on the other side too because then if you have an edge that shaves in one direction you know so it would shave on this side but not on this side that would indicate that you had a burr that was folded over okay and we got nothing there yeah it feels really good really burr free 
really really sharp but not near as toothy as what I'm after um, I guess we can do the whole well here's a here's a newspaper ad we've got renewal by Anderson not that I have anything against these guys it's just I don't really cut a whole lot of paper, so a lot of times you'll see guys do like this. Oh, there we go. I got some of that done. Or you've got the whole, um, the whole push cut thing where you have, let's see if we can do that. Because that's always kind of cool when you see somebody doing that. You know, we better set this down. Where they take newsprint and they fold it over and they set it up. Man, it's been a long time since I tried this thing. Okay. So it may or may not work. And then... Nope. Uh, no, it's just folding over as soon as... Oh, no, there it goes. Oh, ah, okay. So I don't practice that enough. But anyways, so it's pretty sharp, and you know that's the edge that I'm going to test it with. Um, I'm just going to play with that edge around, cutting different things, and then uh, decide if I like it or not. Um, like I said in the past, I haven't really liked it quite as much as the coarser edge, but um, you know this time around might be different. And the worst thing that can happen is that I decide that I like it for some things, or you know I, I don't like it at all. But still, I mean, it's an entirely, you know, I mean, just because you like one edge, I mean, you don't have to marry that one edge, you know, I mean, you can have different edges. I mean, heck, you could even, you know, I mean, if a fellow was really inclined, you could put, you know, a polished edge up in here and then put a coarse edge up in here or a fine edge up on the tip and then a coarse edge through the rest of it. You know, I mean, you could do differential grinds, you know, why not do a differential sharpen? And then, um, you know, the actual edge, you know, I mean, it looks pretty good. I mean, uh, there's not really enough of it. You know, it's not really wide enough to be able to tell if it's like a mirror or anything. A lot of times you'll see um, somebody talking about how they can see how they can see the reflection in the edge which I kind of doubt you can on this one because I mean it it looks looks like a mirror edge and everything you know to my eye but there's I mean there's there's not enough of a width there the blades been ground too thin so anyway so so yeah um, and I did give the uh, the other knife to that friend last night um, I told him I said well you know I'm uh, um, I screwed the the pins up on this knife handle so I can't sell it um, and I, you know, I want him to go ahead and test it out. Um, he doesn't typically wear like jeans and a belt. And so it'll be really interesting to see what he comes up with, how he likes to carry it, whether, um, cause I did set it up just like this sheath. You can do a neck carry. Um, and I did give him some paracord along with it. So he could carry it as a necker right then. And it'll be interesting to see uh, how he ends up carrying it and what his thoughts are on it. Is if it's too big or um, if it's not big enough for his particular taste, uh, he also has a standard necker, so he'll be able to, uh, to get a pretty good judge on it and everything. So that'll be pretty exciting. So anyway, so this will conclude the whole making a new knife pattern, the whole series, 25 videos. I mean, that's, that's a lot. So if you've made it all this way, man, you've got an awful lot of patience. Um, so yeah, so there might be another one you know here in a couple of weeks or I might uh, I'll probably end up running it through the dishwasher sooner or later and you know I'll have to I mean if that's you know causes the handle to pop and everything of course I'll share that with you so uh, I really hope you all enjoyed the video um, I know this is mostly for you know the, the new makers okay I mean I think nobody else is really going to be into knives that much to, to watch this whole thing but if there are one or two or three new, new knife makers out there that go through this whole thing and they pick up some tips and tricks and they end up being the next greatest knife maker or even the next normal knife maker, you know, then this whole thing will have been worth it. Um, 
So again, this is Joe Calton with Calton Cutlery. And visit me on the web, CaltonCutlery.com. I hope you all enjoyed the video. Um, and I hope that I'm going to enjoy testing this knife out for the next couple of weeks. And uh, we will see you next time.